Piltdown Man was an evolutionist fraud that was accepted by the scientific community for 40 years until it was exposed. Over 500 doctoral dissertations were published on Piltdown Man, and who knows if those doctorate degrees were ever taken back. I've heard this argument many times. What I always used to wonder was, knowing that scientists and evolutionists would lie or be fooled about what they find, how can anyone believe in evolution? And that prompted me to investigate. It started with the skull's discovery. According to Charles Dawson when presenting to the Geological Society of London in 1912, the skull was unearthed in 1908 in situ at the Piltdown Gravel Pit in Sussex, England. The other portions were found in the spoil heap from the site. The pieces were later given to him by one of the workmen. Dawson returned to the site several times and discovered several more fragments. He took them to Arthur Smith Woodward at the British Museum. They both returned to the site several times as Dawson continued to uncover more fragments. Woodward reconstructed the skull and discovered that it was nearly identical to a human skull, the most notable difference being that the brain cavity was about two-thirds of that of a normal human. The jaw seemed very chimp-like, with the exception of the two human-like molars. At the time of this discovery, it was assumed that, to survive, our ancestors must have gained their larger brain before losing their overall strength and larger teeth. It seemed unlikely that they could have continued to survive with no weapons at all. Despite this, the reconstruction was immediately rejected at the Royal College of Surgeons. There, Professor Arthur Keith made his own reconstruction perfectly matching a modern human and rejecting Woodward's assumption that the jaw would contain chimp-like canine teeth. He called it Homo pildonensis. In August 1913, Woodward, Dawson, and a Jesuit priest and amateur geologist named Pierre Teilhard de Chardin revisited the spoil heaps. Teilhard soon found a canine that seemed to fit the jaw perfectly. When Woodward proposed that the canines belonged in the reconstruction, Arthur Keith rejected it immediately, pointing out that the wear on human molars are the result of side-to-side -side movement when chewing. The canine in the Piltdown jaw was impossible as it prevented side-to-side -side movement. To explain the wear on the molar teeth, the canine could not have been any higher than the molars. The reconstruction was immediately challenged by the scientific establishment as an ape mandible and human skull by David Waterston of King's College London in Nature in 1913. Also with the Marcellin Bull and American zoologist Garrett Smith Miller in 1915. That year, amidst all of this conjecture, Dawson presented to Woodward more fragments from a similar second skull in an unnamed location he claimed was in Sheffield Park, two miles away from the original find. Woodward presented the fragments the next year to the Geological Society of London. The second skull seemed to confirm the veracity of the first find. In 1921, Henry Fairfield Osborne, president of the American Museum of Natural History, commented that the jaw and skull belonged together without question and that the Sheffield Park fragments were exactly those which we should have expected to confirm the comparison with the original type. He then began to formulate what he referred to as the Dawn Man Theory. I will discuss Osborne and his theory in greater detail in the next chapter, Evolutionist Frauds Part 2. But continuing the Piltdown Man saga, even with the acceptance of Piltdown Man by a few notable scientists, it continued to be controversial. In 1923, Franz Weidenreich concluded that the first skull was human, but even went further to claim that the jaw was an orangutan jaw with filed down teeth. Over the next few years, skepticism grew over the authenticity of the skull as it didn't fit in with other finds. First, because subsequent finds indicated that the scenario of gaining a big brain before losing larger canines was actually wrong. Our ancestors apparently did lose their defenses before gaining a larger brain. Second, because subsequent finds also indicated that our earliest ancestors didn't migrate from Africa until much later. As more and more discoveries came to light, Piltdown Man was was looked on as an anomaly, being so out of sorts that if it were indeed genuine, it would have done more toward disproving evolution than confirming it. In 1953, Kenneth Page Oakley, Sir Wilford Edward Lagrosse Clark, and Joseph Wiener published evidence in Time magazine proving that the Piltdown Man was a forgery. They showed that the fossil was a composite of a human skull of medieval age, a 500-year-old orangutan jaw, and fossilized chimpanzee teeth. The appearance of age was created by staining the bones with an iron solution and chromic acid. On the microscopic level, there were file marks on the teeth. 
It is unknown who actually perpetrated the fraud. Many of those involved were suspicious for several reasons. Teilhard, the Jesuit priest, had previously traveled to regions of Africa where some of the fragments originated. Dawson's antiquarian collection was found to contain at least 38 fakes. It could have been any one or all of the people involved. We may never know. Piltdown Man was definitely a fraud, and while it was accepted by some members of the scientific community, it had never gained wide acceptance. There were no peer-reviewed articles written about it other than to describe it for what it was, a human skull and an ape jaw. Between 1912 and 1953, there were only about 80 doctorates awarded in anthropology, so the claim that 500 dissertations were written about it is impossible. ProQuest is a company that publishes a dissertation and thesis database for universities around the world dating back as far as the mid-1800s. ProQuest records only two theses involving Piltdown Man, and both of them were written after Piltdown Man was confirmed as a hoax in 1953. The big takeaway of Piltdown Man is that peer review is an ongoing process. You could fool people, but you can't predict how they or technology will evolve. If you attempt to foist a fraud upon scientists, sooner or later, someone smarter than you is going to call you out. And once again, that's how creationism taught me real science. Learn more about the real science behind other creationist arguments by watching other episodes. If there's a creationist argument you think I should investigate, please comment below. It may be the subject of a later video. In the meantime, subscribe and make sure you don't miss it.